Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaneen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Uh, welcome to the ICNA ILF uh, Quran webinar series. Inshallah this week we will be continuing on the theme of evidence for the Akira. The verses that we will be studying this week are from Surah Kaf, verses 1 to 18. And today's webinar, inshallah, will be delivered by Imam Farhan Siddiqui. Okay, over to you, Imam Farhan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidil anbiya wal mursaleen, nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. So I was given from Surah Al-Qaf the first 15 ayat, and inshallah what I'd like to do first is talk about some of the major themes of the surah. So Ibn Ashur, he mentions about nine. Uh, the ones that are particularly relevant to us, are, we'll, I'll mention four of them. Uh, in that the there is a praise of the Quran in it. The Quraysh they belied the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he was a man. Uh, in it there is proof of resurrection and there is a warning for the polytheists concerning their belying of the message and the resurrection. Uh, so these things are definitely in very related and connected to what we will be talking about and discussing today, inshallah. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa taala he starts off the surah by saying qaf. Wal Quran al Majid, off by the glorious Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he begins the surah by using one of the Arabic letters off, uh, which has a significance in context of this surah. Uh, it is not directly related to our discussion of the afterlife, but it is an important point nonetheless. And hopefully, inshallah, uh, somebody can ask about it toward that. I don't want to get too much into it right now. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on after this ayah by swearing by this glorious and magnificent book, the Quran. And again, Concerning its magnificence, uh, we'll need a session to discuss on how and why it is magnificent. Uh, magnificent. So the the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put his book together and the way that he presents many of the things and how it is divine in nature is something that dis deserves a discussion in and of itself. Uh, contextually, it's also important to remember that uh, in Ibn Atiyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions that the surah was by agreement of the scholars of tafsir revealed in Mecca. And this is something that is very important and very pertinent to our discussion. So in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَلْ عَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْظِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا شَيْءٌ عَجِيبٌ But the disbelievers are amazed that a warner has come from among them and they say, how strange. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, he continues with this theme of magnificence, magnificence of the Qur'an and indirectly answering the doubt of the disbelievers in the message by saying, yes, this is a man bringing the message, but even you have to recognize the eloquence of that message and how it is not possible to come from a simple man. Uh, also of note here is how they describe him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a warner of some punishment that is to befall them. And the punishment is of two types that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had uh, warned them of, which is the one after death and after resurrection. So the fact that he warned them of these two punishments, along with the third fact that he was from them and he was a man, this decreased their possibility of believing in him, which is why they completely tried to deny and how they said this is something that is extremely strange and something that is very far-fetched. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had approached them and he brought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech to them. And even they recognized that the speech is otherworldly. So even amongst the Quraysh, you had individuals who denied the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and denied the fact that this was divine. But the answers that they had for this speech was that this individual was either had magic done on him or he was possessed or he was insane. So they recognized that this is not normal speech. And this is something, you know, again, to pay heed to and to know. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next ayah, إِذَا مِتْنَا وَكُنَّا تُرَابًا ذَلِكَ رَجْعٌ بَعِيدٌ To come back to life after we have died and become dust, that is too far-fetched. Uh, and this goes back to our discussion of the surah being revealed in Makkah. 
this is one of the biggest contentions that uh, the Quraysh or the polytheists actually had with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would constantly challenge this fact and say that once we have become dust, our lives have ended. So how is it possible that there is a being that is going to come and collect all of that, that dust? And this is why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala answers them in the next ayah saying, قَدْ عَلِمْنَا مَا تَنْقَصُ الْأَرْضِ مِنْهُمْ وَعِنْدَنَا كِتَابٌ حَفِيلٌ we know very well that the earth takes away from them. We keep a comprehensive record. So it's from this point here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues until the 15th ayah where he brings different examples of how he will bring life back to death using different literary techniques and tools to reinforce these points of resurrection. And inshallah, we'll talk about some of these points. So the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins is by addressing the first of their doubts. And some of these doubts were, if we die and become dust that is spread throughout the land, how could any being know all the places that this dust has spread? Therefore, even if an individual knew where all of this dust was throughout the earth, how would he manage to gather it, let alone bring it back to life? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he kind of nips this argument in the bud uh, by addressing this first base doubt, which is the knowledge of where all of this dust travels to once an individual dies and how it's, his body becomes part of the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, what's very interesting is that he does not promise a complete return, but he implies that he will return the spirit to the body and mind and speech, which is actually the essence of that individual. As for his physical return, then he'll be brought back from nothing. So he'll resemble a particular time or age from this world in a form that others recognize him. And this is something that's very important in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that, yes, there will be deficiencies in this individual's body and it will not be the same. Because as that individual died, he will not be brought back in that same form. But his spirit will be the same. His mind will be the same. And his speech, the way he speaks, will be the same. And again, this is the essence of that individual. And the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of here is something that he leaves as a general book and this is to emphasize its greatness and its wonder basically he's saying to the Quraysh that we have an expansive book that records all of these affairs that records where the body deteriorates and how it spreads throughout the earth in the next ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says بَلْ كَذَّبُوا بِالْحَقْ لَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ فَهُمْ فِي أَمْرٍ مَرِيجٍ that but the disbelievers deny the truth when it comes to them they are in a state of confusion so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reinforces the idea of how this quran is something otherworldly and how the mushriqeen are not really sure on how to place it because they had a number of issues here with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They had issues with the truth of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's Tawheed. They had issues with the truth of the Quran. They had issues with the truth of resurrection, which is why they were in this state of confusion. So the next three ayat I've actually bunched together uh, due to time constraints, and uh, they are very relevant to our discussion. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, He says, أَفَلَمْ يَنْظُرُوا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَوْقَهُمْ كَيْفَ بَنَيْنَاهَا وَزَيَّنَّاهَا وَمَا لَهَا مِنْ فُرُوجٍ Do they not see the sky above them, how we have built and adorned it with no rifts in it? وَالْأَرْضُ مَدَدْنَاهَا وَأَلْفَيْنَا فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَا وَأَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ بَهِيجٍ how we spread out the earth and put solid mountains on it and caused every kind of joyous plant to grow in it. تَبْسِرَةً وَذِكْرَ لِكُلِّ عَبْدٍ مُنِيبٍ That as a lesson and reminder for every servant who turns to Allah. So the three examples that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings here are firstly the sky. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't go into particulars concerning the sky. And he just mentions how it is adorned perfectly. And he doesn't even mention the heavenly bodies that it contains. And there are a number of heavenly bodies that even the one who is a novice and in astronomy can see being the sun, the moon, the stars, and sometimes even the planets. And this is interesting to know because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he understands how each individual, according to his depth of understanding, will appreciate the sky and its heavenly bodies. So the more versed is 
an individual with the sky and with its heavenly bodies, the deeper appreciation he'll have of its beauty and how the movements are so much like clockwork. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also emphasizes the fact that there are no seams in the sky and the sky is this one giant continuity. And again, this goes back to what we were talking about in terms of context and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was addressing the Bedouin Arab here. And they don't know of anything that is so large and so vast that does not have any some type of seam or some type of connection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing that out here, saying that there is no joint, there is no seam, there is there's nothing that is causing a rift or a break in the sky. And the next example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings is the earth. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't mention the vastness or the greatness of the earth. That's not what's intended in this verse. He's addressing those whose knowledge of the earth is limited. Again, the Bedouin Ar uh, Arab, which is why he is discussing how he made it e easy to traverse, how he made it easy to travel over. And last example here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings in this set of verses are the mountains. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he describes them as being placed. And had they been placed like a man places stakes for a tent, it would have caused earthquakes and dis and uh, destruction. So what's important, again, to remember here in summary is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings a very logical series to ponder over to the Bedouins of the desert. Because we have to imagine this individual in his journeys or in his travels, because what was unique about the Bedouins is that they were constantly in a state of motion. They were constantly moving and they were constantly traveling. So as this individual traveled, he obviously had a lot of time to look at the world around him. And when he looked at the world around him, it's very different than how we would look up at the world now. You know, because of all the lights and the distractions, it, it becomes more and more difficult to really appreciate our surroundings. But the Bedouin Arabs, they had that time and they had that ability because they were always in this constant state of movement and this constant state of travel. So they would very naturally look up and they would look up to the sky. They would look up and they would see its beauty because when you have an unpolluted clear sky with all, you know, even light pollution, the number of skies and the beauty that an individual looks and he sees when he looks up at it is something really to be amazed at. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really emphasizing that point not only to to this bedouin arab and because he he is the first audience the first audience to the quran were, were these arab and, and like we said that uh, this ver this surah almost by consensus of the mufassirin was was revealed in mecca so these were the individuals who were intended and this is the first audience that who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends but even us even people who are so far removed from this society and people who maybe don't have the same opportunities or chances to appreciate the world around us, we still do get those glimpses and we still get, still do get those opportunities. And not just that, this is something of an encouragement for all of us that sometimes, you know, just stop and take a look around and look at the wonders that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has surrounded us with. So, just imagine this Bedouin man traveling on his camel, you know, he's looking up at the sky and looking how great and amazing it is, looking at the world around him and just thinking like how easy it is from, for him to move from one place to another and looking at these mountains that are around him. Because there's, you know, there's like quite a large mountain range. And for any of you that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed, you know, to make Umrah or Hajj, you, you see the mountains, you know, you see these things, you know, you're traveling through the desert and it just seems like there's these giant pegs and these giant rocks in the ground. So these three things are very relevant to, to this uh, Bedouin Arab. And this is something that he, as well as us, have been commanded to ponder over. And there, there are some great lessons, honestly, in, in that for us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a methodology in proving the reality of his existence through his signs. And we need to understand that there are two major signs that Allah emphasizes and re-emphasizes in the Quran. The first being the, his religious signs. Uh, the first being the greatest example which we have uh, in front of us here, which is the, the Quran. And then he has these worldly signs. So while he brings three general examples here in, in this set of ayat, he will bring more specific examples later on. Uh, is, uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the opportunity to continue on into the surah, we'll, we'll definitely be able to take a closer look at them. But these three general ones are, are very, very deep. And it is a great way, a great methodology for us to actually approach 
others approach non-Muslims in convincing them of the existence of Allah because this is the first step. All right, this is the first step of convincing others that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually exists. And Allah has given us a methodology in his book. He's actually taught us to go and utilize these worldly signs because this is something that all of mankind agrees on. There's nobody who will deny the fact that there exists a sky or there exists, you know, the earth around us or there are stars or there are mountains or there's a sun and the moon. All of these are common commonalities between those who believe and those who disbelieve these are all things that all of us grasp these are things that all of us believe in these are things that all of us know so allah is saying to use these tools use these worldly signs to encourage those who do not believe to accept allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their soul lord as the one who is worthy of worship and once they accept that once they're at that point then there's other logical steps that would lead them to accepting that and accepting uh, Islam. The other thing, the other lesson that we can take away from this is that bringing relevant examples. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did here. And, and this is also something that is, that is really amazing. These things that are very essential to the life of, of this Bedouin Arab, when he's looking around, these things that he experiences and ponders over and wonders out, wonders about and talks about and has poetry about and writes about, these things are very essential to him and a very much part of his lifestyle. So these relevant examples really will help him appreciate these things so much better. You know, talking to you know the Bedouin Arab about about trees maybe might not have the same effect. But maybe talking to us about trees and how amazing they are and the root systems and the leaves and how, you know, the plant lives and how, you know, it sheds its leaves in the fall. These are things that us as as Americans, we would appreciate more because these are things that we experience from day to day. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions those, but he doesn't go into as much depth as he does it concerning these these signs, you know, and talking about the date palm and talking about bees and talking about ants, things that they had much more intimate relationship than, than we would. So the main lesson that uh, I would hope that we could take away from this is that if Allah can bring all of these great creations into existence, and shape them and adorn them according to his will from absolute nothingness, then how much easier is it to recreate? And this is something that's very important because if we look at all of these examples that Allah brings, it's very clear, he's talking about initial creation. He's talking about creating from nothingness. He's not trying to convince them that he can recreate. He's showing them, okay, if I can bring all of this beauty, if I can control it, according to my will, if I can shape it according to my will, if I can beautify it according to my will, how much easier is it to recreate something that already has the blueprints and the plans ready? It's that initial creation that is difficult. And if he's able to do that from nothing, if he's able to bring not just something that is mutated not something that's defective from nothing because even that in itself is is worthy of praise we talk about inventors and how the steps that they had gone through and the difficulties they had and the failed projects that they had but here we're talking about a being that was able to bring perfection the first time from nothing and this is a huge lesson this is a huge lesson this is a huge message that Allah Azza wa Jal is conveying to these uh, to the Quraysh to the non-believers, and this is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He He closes this these set of verses by calling them eye openers. He calls them tabsira, and tabsira the the root of that is from basar, you know, to act, to actually see. So He calls them eye openers, and you know, things that really should open an individual's eyes and open his hearts. And He also calls them reminders. Why are they called reminders? Because these are things that we constantly see. And it's not like the sky changes, you know, in, in its base form. Obviously, there are days that are cloudy and days that are not. But the base sky is always there. That base mountain is always there. The base earth is always there. These are things that we are constantly sealing. These are things that we are constantly dealing with. And this is why Allah says that these are eye openers, reminders for all those slaves that anabu, yani munib, the ones that turn to him. Because those are the individuals that will truly benefit from these reminders. And, and this is a really a great lesson. This really is a great lesson in, in understanding how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect us. 
because if we think about it yes there is a base and you know we we already existed and he brought us into existence from nothingness so he he already has the blueprints he had already put all of this together this is it won't be something new to him and this is the main lesson that he azza wa jal is is bringing here that he is putting across to us and making relevant to not only the Bedouin Arab, who, like we said, was the first audience, but also, also to us. Because while these, and like I said, maybe we won't have the same appreciation as someone who deals with these things so intimately, we still do appreciate them. How many of us have gone camping? You know, how, how many of us have traveled? How many of us, you know, have, have maybe gone up and gone hike, you know, hiking up a mountain? So we, we can appreciate these things, even though we don't have it an intimate or a recurring uh, relationship with them so um it, it looks like we're almost out of time so i will stop here but you know I, I would i did want to discuss a little bit about the rain and the the dates but inshallah we can always leave that for another time and how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, destroyed previous nations and how he brings them as as an example for us but uh, bi ta'ala we'll, uh, we'll maybe we can go over that another time inshallah والله اعلم وصلى الله على خير خلق نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم جزاك الله خير so inshallah we'll open up the uh, Q&A session now so if you can start uh, uh, sending your questions in via the questions tab within the webinar um, inshallah the first question when the signs of Allah or the eye openers um, are presented to different people, um, such as the sky uh, above us, um, each person tends to respond differently. And as we learned within these verses, um, the non-believers sometimes reject these signs. But for us as Muslims, what can we do so that when we ponder on these signs, they have a positive impact on our Iman. What should we be doing in terms of how we approach these signs um, of Allah in front of us? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa rasulullah. This is it's a very good question and we should ponder over them just as the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has demanded and commanded us to ponder over them, uh, meaning appreciate them. Uh, this is something that is very important to do in when you look up at these signs and to appreciate them and look at the perfection of them. So there are a number of ways. And like the brother mentioned or the sister, it's it's very important how the approach is to that. So you will find different people who will actually want to go and study the astronomy and go into more depth concerning that. And if that is something that you have a drive for, and if it's that's something that will bring you more yaqeen into the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he made and what he did, then this is definitely a path that an individual should take. But there are some people who will appreciate it superficially. They'll look up at the sky and like, they'll just say, subhanAllah, wow, that's amazing. Look at what an amazing thing that Allah made. And that's enough for, that's enough for them. And there are some people who, who will say, yes, you know, it is something that's amazing. I want to learn more about it. I want to learn more about how it works. I want to learn more about the system that Allah created. And the more in depth an individual goes, he should increase in appreciation for the, the beauty and the intricacy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put behind all of, all of this creation. Can you describe what's actually meant by the sky? Um, in, in these verses, is it just what we see above us or what's the actual definition of sky? Okay, so like, like I said, uh, in general, it, this is going to be based on the audience that, that it is given to. So when we talk about the first audience here, it would be the superficial sky, the sky that we actually see. Because if we put it in context with the other verses, it's very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding this individual who is being addressed to look at the world uh, around him. But it doesn't mean that the sky needs to be limited to what's above us or the earth needs to be limited to what we can see. Obviously, you know, there, there's layers to the earth that is below us. There's a depth and a core to mountains that's around us. And there's the sky, you know, when the sky ends and it obviously goes into space, which has its own, um, which has its own beauty, which has its own mysteries, which has its own sciences. So this is going to go back to the depth of the audience. It's going to go back to the depth of the individual who is trying to perceive it and who is listening to these verses. 
but if we look just at the, the face value of the verse, it would seem just the world around him and just to appreciate the immediate world around us. But again, because every individual is going to go on to different depths concerning that, it can go beyond that. Allah The name for the surah, uh, Surah Kaf, uh, mm. what, what does it mean? Okay, so there, there is a difference of opinion of the scholars, and I'm, I'm glad this, this question did come. Uh, but uh, a lot of what, uh, unfortunately, what has become very um, prevalent amongst the people is when people are asked about Qaf or Yasin or Alif Lam Mim, they say this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept his, you know, he has kept his knowledge of those things. But this is a very, this is a minority opinion. If you actually go back to the classical books, uh, you know, Tabari, he mentions about either 17 or 25. I don't, I don't recall at this moment, a uh, difference difference of opinion on how to approach these letters and wallahu alam if we look at the context of these letters and how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses them it would seem that allah is presenting these letters so whether it be alif lam mim you know kitab or qaf al quran al majid uh, so if we look at them contextually it would seem that allah is presenting these as a challenge to the arab saying that i'm using your letters from your language to produce a speech that is more eloquent. So in summary, these letters, wallahu alam, it would seem, and this is something that Imam Tabari also mentions, it would be a challenge to the Arab. It's a challenge to the Arab it, to bring something similar to that. So even if we go back to the Qaf here, it says Qaf wal Quran al Majid, meaning that this book is being used by the letters that you speak with. We challenge you to bring something similar using those letters by this glorious Quran. Okay, there's a question about um, where is the soul and where is the body um, after we die and, and go into the grave? Are they together? Are they separate? Do they travel? Uh, okay. Can you explain this? Uh, very, very quickly, there's a, there's a hadith that actually deals with this, talking about how at the time of death, the, the soul is removed, then the soul is questioned, and then the soul is returned to the body. And this, this is uh, very quickly in summary, uh, without going into too much detail, concerning the Hayat Barzakhiyah, which is the life in the, in the grave. But uh, very quickly, that's what it is. Allah. Okay. You talked about religious signs, and you talked about worldly signs, signs of Allah. Mm -hmm. um, is the Quran the only religious sign, or are there other religious signs as well? No, there, it is not the only religious sign. The Quran is just the one that uh, is the most prominent and is the one that is established until Yom Al-Qiyamah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of the signs of Allah, the many miracles that happened at, at his hand. Uh, even the signs that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, how many of us have uh, you know, avoided an accident and we said there was no way that I would have been saved had it not been for Allah. Uh, the Zamzam is another sign. Uh, that, that we have that has been established as a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are a number of religious signs. Uh, the, the Quran was just meant to be used as, as an example. But uh, there, all of these other ones I mentioned are, are very prominent. There are a number of miracles that happened at the hand of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa There are karamat, um, also miracles that happen at the hands of the awliya. Uh, all of these things have, have been established in the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah. When it's said that uh, Allah will bring the humankind back from death, um, when would this actually happen? Um, is this coming back to death um, on the day of judgment or is this coming back um, from death um, during the barzakh, dur during the time in the grave? And, uh, and this is actually talking about Yom Qiyamah. This is talking about the day of judgment. Okay. Can you um, explain how one should discuss the signs of Allah with a non-Muslim? Uh, it's going to vary based on the non-Muslim that he's discussing with. So if uh, it, it depends on the depth of knowledge, it's, it's going to be a case by case. There, there's not going to be one general pattern that he can discuss with them. Because, you know, if you take a, a layman, maybe somebody who has like a high school education or something, and you, you say, okay, listen, 
all of this, do you really think it came from nothing? It might be enough for him. It might be convincing enough for him. And you might have people who are professor, professors in particular fields who will need a little bit more, you know, they'll need a little bit more time. You might have to actually have to get into discussions with them of natural physics and quantum physics. So every person is going to have a different depth. And that depth at the end of it, the thing that we need to understand, and sometimes we, we forget this, is that science has never been an answer for why. Uh, Islam is the answer for why. Islam has always been an, an answer for how, because science is a discussion of mechanisms, and Islam is a discussion of origins, and it's a discussion. Uh, it's a religious discussion. So uh, this is something that we always have to keep in mind when when we're discussing or when we're uh, when we're debating uh, with non-Muslims concerning the natural world around us. Uh, so if we have those, if we keep those questions in mind, it's something that's very important because the thing is at the end of the day, you know, it, it ends up going into also philosophical arguments about the, you know, the, the, the mover and everything requires a mover. So there has to be an unmoved mover, which is, uh, you know, uh, something that goes back to, you know, philosophical origins. But at the end of the day, again, it requires certain depth based on the person. Uh, there's, there's not a, uh, one prescription fits all kind of deal here. It's going to be case by case. Can you explain a little bit more about how people will be recreated with respect to their soul, their mind, their speech, and their physical form? Uh, in particular, how old will people be when they're raised up again? Um, now we have we have specific narrations concerning an individual when he's raised up in paradise so they say he'll be close close to the age of 40 because this is considered that individual's prime uh, as for how he'll be raised up on the day of judgment we have a, a number of different descriptions of people who oppressed others uh, descriptions of people who were shaheed in this world and how they'll continue you know they'll continue bleeding but they'll have the smell of musk uh, we'll have people who, you know, who had multiple wives and they're unfair with their wives and how one side will be lower than another. We have people whose faces will be enlightened, people whose faces will be darkened uh, on the, on that day. So on the day of judgment itself, wallahu uh, alam. That's, that's not so, something I can speak about. The only thing I can speak about is that we will have physical bodies and our our mental state and our ability to speak, those things will be intact because those things are directly connected to the ruh. Those things are connect directly connected to the spirit. And as for paradise, again, we have specific narrations concerning that, talking about that an individual will be around the age of 40 uh, because he or she, that is the an individual's prime. Allahu The opening verse of um, this surah uh, referred to the Quran as uh, al-Majid. Mm -hmm. um, the Quran is referred to in, you know, many, many different words are used. Um, can you provide some perspective on why the word Majid uh, is used uh, for this surah? Okay, uh, like Majid is something that it is, it is meant to be praised in and of itself. It's, it's not as a reaction to anything. Um, it, it is something that in it of itself, because of the way that it is put together and because of the way that it is versed, because of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has formed the verses in it, it is deserving of that praise. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is this is actually a, a swear. Allah actually makes a vow here saying, by the, by the gl glorious Quran. And what is actually intended here is that I swear by the glorious Quran, which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has come with and is the truth and and this is what is understood uh, by this and Allah will use different characteristics and different ways to describe the Quran based on what is intended in those verses or based on what is intended by the goals of those particular surahs so over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can see that he is here just it is a means to completely denounce the, the disbelievers and their and their disrespect and their disregard for the Quran. So he he starts with this and how he talks about how it's glorious and magnificent because it is uh, it is coming from him Azza wa Jal and it in, in its eloquence is something that like we had mentioned before that the, the even the Arabs recognized. Okay. With respect to the order of surahs uh, in the Quran. 
Now, is the order with which you find the surah in the Quran in itself considered to be divine? Uh, there's there's a difference of opinion uh, amongst the scholars because we do have specific narrations where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he ordered certain particular surahs but we don't have any narrations that say that he ordered them completely uh, and um, Allahu Alam, like I said, there's a difference of opinion in um, Imam Suyuti, he mentions it in Itqan on whether they are divine in nature or whether they're something from, from Ijtihad but um, what what is what is clear and what uh, the you know majority of the mufassirin are on are concerning the order of the ayat. So the verses there's there's pretty much an agreement on how those are divine. But the order of the surahs again there's there is a difference a valid difference of opinion on whether it's divine in nature or whether it was from the ijtihad of the sahaba when they put the Quran together. For Allah knows best. Okay. So just uh, one more question is slightly off topic, but you know, we can cover it since we, we have a little bit of time. Okay. Um, the question is, how do we know um, whether we're, we're having a hard time in this life is a test or a punishment from Allah? Um, well, this, this goes back to the individual. Uh, it goes back to the state of the individual. It goes back to an individual's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and, and a good way of judging, you know, my relationship or your relationship with Allah is seeing what my relationship is with his book. If I have a good relationship with the Quran, and by a good relationship, uh, and this is this is something that I, I do want to really emphasize here, I, I don't mean just taking the blessing from it. And, and what I mean by that is just by parroting the words on the page. Uh, by parroting the words on the page, there is definitely blessing in that. There, there's no doubt about it. The Prophet ﷺ was very specific in the reward an individual gets just by reading, just by parroting the words there. But sometimes we forget that this is a book of guidance. And, and this guidance is Allah, He sent this book to us. And there are many times that we will open up the Mus'haf, we will open up the Quran and we'll find and we'll feel that Allah is directly addressing us in those verses, sometimes dealing with different hardships or dealing with different things that are going on in our lives. So sometimes we might feel that Allah is punishing us, sometimes we might feel that Allah is testing us, but it, it's very important for us to constantly try to maintain our relationship with, with His book because that is one of the best ways to relate, maintain a relationship with Him. Because some, sometimes, you know, we, we hear, we say things like, you know, well, you know, I always make my salah on time or, you know, I've, I've been constantly giving zakat. You know, why are these things happening to me? Well, it, just by me asking that question or looking at that question, it really depends on where am, where am I in life right now? You know, what, what have I been doing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have I been fulfilling my rights? Have I had good manners when I deal with others, I deal with myself, I deal with my parents. It, it's very important to do a lot of the self-analysis. It's very important to do a lot of this tazkiyat and nafs. Uh, this is why you find a lot of the ulama uh, really stressing on this. Um, you know, Imam Ghazali, he stresses on this quite a bit uh, in his ihya. And, uh, and then there are many scholars who followed them even, you know, in, in their muqtasarat, in their uh, shortened versions of, of his ihya. You know, from the shortest of them being Minhaj Salikin. So, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, man, I forgot the name of the book. Ibn Qudama. But anyway, it is, it's irrelevant. The The important thing is that we, we always have to have the sense of self-accountability. And we always have to go back and we have we always have to look at ourselves. You know, the, the Sahaba, they, they were such that they would worry when there wasn't any test or there wasn't any trial. But, you know, their, their level of Iman is very different. But if we try to be like them, if we try to emulate them, then we, we will get to a point where the test will come and, and we'll be happy that Allah is testing us. And, and that's, that's the, one of the highest levels of Iman. So, you know, I would advise this individual and, you know, myself and others that it's very important to do the self-analysis. You know, where am I, stand, where, what, how am I standing with Allah? What is my standing with Allah? And, and one of the best gauges for that is what is my standing and what is my relationship with his book? Allah. And a follow on to that. Um, how do we maintain this um, important relationship with the Quran? Uh, by having a word, 
And this is something that was classically done by the companions that they would read a certain amount of Quran every day, every week. Uh, and this is something that's extremely important. And for, for us as, as foreigners, as non-Arabs, I, I advise everyone the same thing, that it's important to have two, two word. So for, for us as, as, uh, as Ajami, we, we should have two word. One, actually parroting the words and reading from, from the Mus'haf and taking the blessing in that. And that could be, you know, one juz, two juz, you know, half a juz, a page, or whatever that is, just be consistent upon that. And the second word should be the translation. So that can be one verse, it could be 10, it could be five pages, whatever. You know, it's very important that we, we have that because if we understand how we are being addressed and what we are being addressed with, we will have a much deeper and much more meaningful relationship uh, with the Quran. Uh, there are a number of translations out there. Um, the one that I have up here on the screen right now, this is actually Abdul Halim. I, I really like his translation. There's very few times that I've, I've disagreed with his translation. Um, in, in general, it has a good flow. It's, it's easy to read. His language is good. Uh, I believe there are a few more new ones out. I think the, the Clear Quran uh, by Furqan Academy or Foundation, I heard that one is good too. But um, basically go back to uh, Islam Awakened is a good website. It has a list of, you know, I, th I think like 30 translations or something. Uh, that's a good site to go back to uh, for just for reference and to compare the different translations. At the end of the day, you want to read the translation that you are comfortable with, uh, that you enjoy. Uh, that you really like to sit down with and, and enjoy the read. Because if you're not understanding the language, it's going to discourage you from reading the Quran. So find a translation that you enjoy the language of it, and you can actually sit down and and, and really go through and understand what it is the, the author is trying to translate to you. Because translation in itself, is, it's an art. It's a type of tafsir. So you need somebody who's, who's really good in that and who has a good grasp of it. Some verses of the Quran um, tend to have more of an impact on an individual than others. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the verses, for example, that we studied here, uh, mm -hmm. which are Makkan surahs, yes. um, one can argue that these Makkan surahs primarily are, are addressing the non-Muslims, people who haven't yet accepted Islam. I've already accepted Islam. I believe in the Akira. Uh, are these verses going to have less impact on me because I'm already a Muslim? Um, how should we feel about these these points? I, I mean, our, our relationship with the Quran is is ours. I mean, it's it's my individual relationship that I have, and there are always going to be verses that impact me more. So even though I believe in the Akhirah or I believe in Allah, we have to understand that Yaqeen and Iman is of levels. So. Yes, it might not impact me today, but maybe five years from now, maybe ten years from now, maybe even tomorrow, I'll go over the same verse and I'll I'll have I've developed a deeper appreciation for it. My yaqeen in that has increased. Because at the end of the day, our iman, our yaqeen, these are the things that are going to prevent us from sinning. These are the things that are going to help us develop a relationship with Allah. These are the things that are going to prevent me from lying. These are the things that are going to, to force me to have a good relationship with my neighbor. These are the things that are going to encourage me to listen to my parents. So it, it's, yes, you know, absolutely. Will some verses impact me more today than they do tomorrow? I mean, maybe I've, I've, I've faced some tragedy. Maybe I got a raise. They're, they're, a human being is, just, you know, a ball of emotion. He's, he's, he or she is always going to have their ups and downs. And that's where the Book of Allah comes in. Because it, it helps us channel those emotions appropriately. And, and not just that, sometimes, you know, even though, though that was the initial audience, you know, the Quraysh was the initial audience, the Jews were the initial audience, the Christians from, uh, from uh, Banu Najjar who came, that was the initial audience. But that doesn't mean they were the only audience. And, and, and I know all of us can attest to the fact that we've opened up the Quran at some point in our lives and we read a verse and we felt that this verse was revealed for me. So, it, it, and that's that's the universality of this book, and and that's the amazing nature of this book. So we should always try to appreciate that. And are there certain verses that'll hit me more than others? Yeah, that's fine. I, I, there, there's no issue with that. There's nothing wrong with that. There are certain verses that we might skim over. I, again, I mean, that's it's it's very natural. It's very human. But it, part of being human is to develop that relationship because a relationship takes work. It's it's not something that happens.